Bueno, buenos días a todos. Vamos a comenzar un poco. Bienvenidos a este evento de la Red de Salud. Um, estoy muy contenta de, de, de tener con nosotros hoy día a la profesora Sigal Zvieri, que es la directora de la Unidad de eh, eh, Terapia Intensiva en Adasa, uh, en el Hospital Adasa, y que nos va a explicar un poquito el enfoque de Adasa um, en la logística de, de terapia intensiva. Eh, la presentación va a ser en inglés, entonces tenemos una interpretación y pueden tener la interpretación con el icono abajo de su pantalla y poner el audio, uh, el canal audio en español y así van a tener la interpretación. Okay. Professor Sigal Zviri, I just give a small introduction um, and I introduced you, so I'm going to give you the floor. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I'll share the screen. Can you see this? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Sigal Sviri, and I'm the director of the medical and the COVID-19 intensive care units at Hadassah, Jerusalem. And I would like to thank you very much for inviting me to talk to this uh, Latin America event. Uh, I would uh, use the next 40 minutes or so to give uh, an overview of the healthcare system, but I would like to, or in Israel, but I would like to focus on critical care, especially the Hadassah approach to critical care and how this helped us during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I would finalize with a little bit of ethical issues which influence our end of life decision-making in Israel. So as you can see, relative to countries like Argentina and Brazil, Israel is a small country and uh, we are surrounded by Egypt and Jordan with which we have peace um, uh, agreements and Syria and Lebanon with which we do not. The Israeli population is about nine and a half million and it comprises of 75% Jews and 21% Arabs. And if we look at the age pyramids, we see that uh, Israel is a young country uh, relative to countries in Europe and uh, Asia, for example, uh, but quite similar to Latin America countries. Um, the life expectancy for Jews in Israel is much higher or higher than the OECD average. And if we look at the numbers, we see that it reaches 80.7 years for males and 84.8 years for females. And the fertility rate is also high. It's about three per woman, which again is higher than most uh, Western countries. The birth rate is high and the infant mortality rate is low. Um, the two uh, population groups with the highest um, um, growth rate are the ultra Haredi Jews uh, and the Arab population. And this may influence our uh, uh, population mix in the next few years. As expected, uh, the Israeli population is expected to increase, especially in the elderly population. Look at the rise in the 75 and above age group. And uh, we have to plan for this and accommodate this in our healthcare system. This is only uh, not only in Israel, but all over the world. And it definitely will influence the way we practice medicine. Um, the healthcare expenditure in Israel is lower than the OECD average, and here we can see it reaches 7.5% of the GDP relative to 8.8%, and here in the triangles, triangles we see the increase in health expenditure during the COVID-19 pandemic. So re this really is an important episode in uh, worldwide healthcare. The number of acute care beds in Israel is lower than the OECD average, as you can see. And this also refers to critical care beds. So if the European average is 11.5 beds per 100,000 in Israel, it's only 
We also have less doctors than the OECD average and much less nurses. So how do we do this? How do we have good health measures, but we have so little infrastructure? So really this is a combination of environmental parameters, good nutrition, uh, Middle Eastern nutrition, uh, family and social support, very strong in our community, but also the way we use uh, our healthcare system. And this, this is what I will talk about. So first of all, in the community, every citizen has to have access to healthcare. This is under the National Health Insurance Law of 1994. And um, this is compulsory. So everybody must uh, have access to healthcare. And you can choose any one of four competing nonprofit health funds, and you can move from one to the other. So they compete to uh, attract you. And each health fund must supply all the health services in the health basket. So the health basket is defined by the government and the special committee, and it contains all the uh, uh, preventive, uh, the evaluation and the treatments that every single citizen is entitled to. And the government transfer the funds to the health funds and they provide the services in the basket. So there is high quality of care in the community and the community is also a gatekeeper so that there are less transfers to acute care hospitals. There is also an excellent data system which monitors health markers, has good prevention programs and vaccinations. So in the COVID-19 vaccinations, uh, the health funds actively called uh, the population, especially the elderly population and invited them to get vaccinated. And so they could monitor what was going on. More than 85% of Israelis have supplementary and or private and disability insurance. So on top of the health basket, they can also choose their surgeon and they can go to private facilities to get elective treatments. And this obviously reduces the waiting time for procedures. In terms of hospital management, management most of the hospitals are government owned. Some are owned by one of the health funds called Klalit, and there are other pu publicly, privately owned public hospitals such as Hadassah and other private facilities. The bed occupancy rate in Israel is one of the highest in the world. So this obviously means that the average length of stay in the hospital is lower than the average. And this also means that the system is very, very efficient. So in terms of critical care training, so if you want to become a critical care physician, you need to study six years of medical school, then one year internship, four to five years of residency. This depends if you're coming from anesthesia, medicine, surgery, or pediatrics. And then you do your ICU fellowship and then post fellowship training. So really, if you want to become a critical care physician in Israel, it takes you about 15 years. What about the nurses? The nurses have four year basic training in nursing school, then they do a, a BA degree. And if they want to become critical care nurses, they need to do a long course uh, with formal uh, and hands-on training in critical care. The Society of Critical Care defined that the uh, nurse-patient ratio must be at least one to two. Sometimes in ECMO patients, it's one to one. And the units need to have enough monitoring equipment and, in, and uh, uh, treatment possibilities for invasive and non-invasive organ support. So here we see an example in my unit of uh, the monitoring and advanced ventilation and nitric oxide and uh, uh, continuous hemodialysis. So patients admitted to ICU are usually patients in multi-organ failure. They are unstable. Uh, they need advanced ventilation, high dose inotropic, inotropic support, advanced hemodynamic monitoring, advanced organ support. Uh, they may have bleeding or trauma or major surgery or burns. So really very high 
complex medical patients. But sometimes there aren't enough ICU beds and the patients are not so complex, but they're relatively complex. So then we have intermediate care units and nearly every medical department in Israel has an intermediate care unit. So this is a, a, or sometimes called step down unit or high dependency care unit. It's a four to five bed area with one to four nursing. And in Israel, the patients in the intermediate care unit can get obviously monitoring, but also ventilation, both non-invasive and invasive. They can receive vasopressors and they have dialysis. So really some of the patients in the intermediate care in Israel are really ICU patients. But the medical department staff, as a result, know how to treat ventilated patients in the wards and in the intermediate care units. And this also helps us manage with a high load of uh, complex patients, as I will show you later. So all the medical departments have an intermediate care unit. We also have intermediate stroke units, surgical units, hematology units, and the patients usually have single organ failure and are stable on, on the support they receive. So this allows preloading to ICU, meaning that not all patients come to ICU, some, some can stay in the intermediate care. And it's also afterloading from ICU so that we can discharge the patient sooner to the intermediate care than we would do if they were going to the ward. What about post-admission uh, capabilities in the community? So we have many uh, rehabilitation centers for orthopedic injuries, neuro rehabilitation and cardiac rehabilitation. We also have centers for weaning from ventilation and even chronic ventilation centers, which I will show you later on. Uh, we have geriatric rehabilitation departments, especially uh, experienced in gradual rehabilitation of the geriatric population. We have home hospital programs and chronic care facilities. So in summary up to now, how do we do it? Well, we have compulsory health insurance where everyone is covered. We have excellent community care and competition between the four health funds. We have a good and updated health basket. We have up-to-date databases and preventive medicine. We have chronic facilities, home care and rehabilitation in the community. In the hospitals, we have high occupancy with a larger turnover and shorter stays. There is extensive medical education and training, which I will show you. And we have good infrastructure going from the wards to intermediate care units to ICUs that can treat complex cases. So what is the Hadassah way and how did it help us in the pandemics? What are the lessons we can take from uh, what we have done here? So a few words about Hadassah. Hadassah started with Henrietta Salt coming to Israel in, in 1912. And she tried to um, implement some of the good practices in community care and preventive care uh, 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 that she could uh, at that situation. Uh, the Mount Scopus campus was opened in 1939, but then abandoned after the independence war. And uh, a few centers for Hadassah were opened in the center of town. In 1961, the uh, Enkarem campus was opened. Uh, and in 1975, the Mount Scopus campus was reopened uh, after liberation of uh, East Jerusalem. Uh, we have a pediatric hospital building opened in 1995, an emergency room building <coughs> opened in 2005, and the new Davidson uh, admission tower opened in 2012. So the HMO mission statement is that it pioneered the development of healthcare standards and practices in Israel. We make it a bridge to peace. We forge links between people of all nationalities, races and religion. And if we look down here, we can see my medical unit staff and it comprises of uh, secular Jews, religious Jews, secular Arabs, 
religious Arabs and two Olim Chadashim, new immigrants, one from South Africa and one from Mexico. So really we have a mixture of not only patients, but also um, uh, the team working together in harmony. And the organization is committed to excellence in advanced healthcare, research and teaching. So these are the two um, campuses for Hadassah, the Ain Karam campus with 900 beds and the Mount Scopus campus with 400 beds. It is an ultra modern uh, facility with uh, all in all 1,300 beds, 31 operating theaters and nine ICUs. And we have new technologies such as linear accelerators, cyclotron, robotic surgery, new cath labs, hybrid operating rooms, digital PET CT and GMP laboratories. So really it is an advanced um, uh, medical center. Now the internal medical division where I work comprises of different um, wards and units that all can send patients to the medical ICU. So really the medical ICU supports the internal med medical division, the medical wards, the intermediate care units, the subspecialties such as gastro, liver, nephrology, immunology, pulmonology, also cardiology, infectious diseases, and very importantly, hemato-oncology and bone marrow transplant patients who are in increasing need for intensive care. And this is uh, on top of the surgical, the general surgical unit that admits the complicated surgical cases and the trauma patients. So really this is in addition, and this makes the internal medicine division very strong in terms of treatment of critically ill patients. So the different ICUs at Hadassah include a general ICU run by anesthesiologists, the medical ICU where I work run by people from internal medicine, the cardiac ICU, cardiothoracic ICU, neurosurgical ICU, pediatric ICU, and neonatal ICU. And this enable, uh, enables us to provide an extensive range of professional experience in critically ill patients. So what should we invest in when we talk about critical care? Most importantly, the human research resource, and we need to perform outreach education and training. We also need to enhance teamwork between different teams, and this is what we've done and I'll show you. So how do we train our doctors? So first of all, in Hadassah, every resident in internal medicine, anesthesiology and surgery has to do critical care training for two to six months. So you don't have to be a critical care fellow, but it's enough that you were resident in any of these specialties and already you're, uh, you must do critical care training. And during this critical care training, you under they understand critical care physiology, mechanical ventilation, hemodynamic monitoring and support, organ support. They learn how to insert lines and do procedures and use point of care ultrasound. Some of the uh, workshop and courses that we do for our residents include an airway workshop. Here we see one of my consultants during, doing an airway uh, uh, workshop for the residents, a uh, mechanical ventilation workshop, uh, we also have point of care ultrasound courses doing uh, abdominal, lung and uh, point of care echo. And here we see one of my consultants using a TOFU model to insert central lines via ultrasound. Uh, the cardiologists were very happy to teach us how to do echo because it allowed us to do the echo inside the COVID-19 units uh, we transferred the pictures to them and then they could stay outside and look at the pictures. Uh, we also have an international basic intensive care course. This is a course founded in uh, Hong Kong and Australia and adopted in many countries of the world in Europe, Africa and Asia and recently in South America. 
Uh, and it is a very good course for young physicians and nurses learning how to treat critically ill patients. So if anybody is interested in details, I could uh, provide them for you. We also have a continuous renal and replacement therapy school where we train nurses and doctors from all intensive care units in Hadassah and all over the country, how to set up and troubleshoot continuous renal and rep replacement therapies such as CVVHD. And this is a very popular uh, course. Uh, we have a monthly ECMO course for physicians and nurses, and really the COVID-19 pandemic uh, caused a, a, a lot of uh, learning and use of ECMO, which we did not have before. And sometimes, and as we can see here, we had three or four ECMO patients in one department. So really, uh, we got a lot of exposure to uh, ECMO patients, but this does not work without proper training. This is a nationwide dashboard showing the uh, amount of ECMOs in each center in Israel. And when there is a call for a, a patient who requires ECMO in one of the peripheral hospitals, the uh, uh, central uh, decision-making unit in the Ministry of Health decides where to send the patient uh, according to uh, this dashboard. And here we can see one of our ECMO transfers in Yom Kippur last year, uh, where we had to take an ECMO patient from the Haria Hospital, if you know it's far north, all the way to Jerusalem. So very challenging. So how did the ICU structure at Hadassah help us during the COVID-19 pandemic? So first of all, in terms of numbers, uh, Israel's population is nine and a half million and nearly half of the population was demonstrated to uh, have COVID-19. Uh, probably many more had it. Uh, the death uh, rate was relatively low, 0.27%. And this is mostly because of the fact that many of the patients with COVID-19 were children and adolescents. And subsequently to the vaccination, a lot of people were vaccinated and this obviously reduced some of the um, uh, contraction rate and also severe disease rate. And uh, we had a very good vaccination program in Israel, uh, very quick to vaccinate more than 60% of uh, the population. And if we look at uh, the age distribution, we see that most of the elderly population are now both vaccinated and boosted a third and even a fourth time. We see here when we look at the severely ill patients that most of the severely and critically ill patients were not vaccinated. So the vaccination really reduced the severity of illness. Now the um, uh, diversity or the, the um, uh, areas of crowded population uh, in Israel affected Hadassah significantly. Here we see two uh, areas of crowded population with a high load of COVID-19. One was in the Tel Aviv area in uh, uh, Nebak, ultra-Haredi ultra, ultra uh, area. And around Jerusalem, we had two populations, very crowded populations. One was the Haredi Jewish area of Mea Sharim, and the other was the Arab population in East Jerusalem. So these impacted uh, Hadassah significantly and uh, relatively more than other areas in the country. And over the one, two, three, four, five waves of COVID that we've had, uh, we have had more than 6,200 admissions to the hospital, 10% of which needed ICU. So high severity of illness with increased mortality. So 29% mortality versus the usual 17% and a long length of stay, 12 days versus the usual seven days. So a very large amount of critically ill patients with heavy morbidity and mortality. And if we look at a dashboard, a national dashboard of the amount of ventilated patients in the country, we see that uh, Hadassah, again, has one of the highest numbers of ventilated cases uh, throughout the pandemic. 
So the goals of the hospital administration were to prevent cross infection to the staff and the patients, to give confidence to the staff with adequate protective measures and equipment, and to provide the best medical care, not only to COVID-19 patients, but also to regular patients. And we had regular, or even daily, multidisciplinary meetings, Zoom meetings, and updates with clinical managers and stakeholders. So everybody was on the Zoom meeting every morning, the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacologists, the engineers, everybody involved in, the, in to know what is expected of us during the next 24 hours. We had circulation of updates of treatment protocols, um, Ministry of Health guidelines for COVID-19, which were changing all the time. Uh, we had regular staff screening, so we had to test for COVID every two weeks so that positive uh, staff was isolated. And then subsequently in the vaccination program, again, very intensive vaccination program for our teams. Uh, we, get, we had a lot of input with the infectious diseases people showing us how to isolate COVID-19 areas and how to act inside. Uh, we needed a lot of flexibility in opening and closing wards and ICUs for COVID-19 patients, which I will show you. And obviously, at some uh, points in time, we had to reduce elective activity and prioritize our treatments. So we decided to put all the COVID-19 patients in the round building. You see the round building here. It is separate from the admission Davidson building here. And uh, uh, luckily for us, this is currently renovated, but at the time the pandemic started, it was empty. Uh, so we can actually use the space to uh, build six new COVID-19 medical wards. And this is on top of the medical wards in the Davidson building, one intermediate care unit, three adult ICUs, so I had to open three new ICUs from scratch for COVID-19 patients, one pediatric ICU, and all of this while maintaining usual activity, which is very, very challenging. And we made a decision that patients who are stable on oxygen, high flow nasal cannula, and non-invasive ventilation can be admitted to the medical or intermediate care units for COVID-19, but, Patients who are unstable, deteriorating or non-responding, requiring mechanical ventilation were transferred to the ICU for COVID-19 patients, as well as all patients requiring ICU for other reasons, such as surgery or sepsis. Critically ill patients were treated by dedicated and experienced intensive care teams, except for patients with poor prognosis. So we had to open new ICUs, large ICUs. So we would take a, a new, a, an old medical ward and we would transform it within a week to a full ICU with beds and equipment and monitoring and telecommunication and everything we needed uh, to function. And we really needed to be quick and flexible. Luckily, we had a lot of equipment. Uh, the Ministry of Health transferred to, uh, to us and to all hospitals, many ventilators, uh, high flow nasal uh, oxygen machines. We had ultrasound and uh, video laryngoscopes. And also we had some donations from uh, different uh, uh, institutions, including Hadassah. So the teamwork was essential. We had a lot of teamwork between all intensivists, from anesthesia, from medicine, consultants, fellows, residents, everybody working together and rotating. We took all the nursing, or some of the nursing staff from the general ICU medical, different ICUs, all working together in the COVID-19 units. Obviously, we did not have enough nurses, so we had to close some of the regular ICU beds but really all of the nurses worked together to try and handle the high load of critically ill patients. 
but we also did an innovative training, in, intensive training program for the nurses. And this really was uh, uh, fantastic. And it was uh, presented in the nursing conferences where we took a room with two to three patients. And in that room, we had one critical care nurse and one non-critical care nurse working together to treat these patients for eight hour shifts with one-to-one -one hands on training. So at the end of several shifts like that, we created a reservoir of trained nurses, which we could use as required in future waves. We try to maintain the standard of care, doing ward rounds inside, procedures, um, ventilation. Look how many doctors and nurses it takes to prone a patient in the COVID unit. And of course, some people prefer to pray. Triage is a, a, a big challenge in, in ICU in general, and also especially in the COVID-19 pandemic, because we did not have enough beds. And we need to be very careful about triage because some countries decided that age is the primary triage uh, parameter, which is, which is a bit unfair, obviously. So we need to look also at multimorbidity and comorbidity, frailty, which, are, which will, uh, I will describe, and obviously patient preferences. We saw during the pandemic that patients who were above the age of 70 indeed had a very high mortality compared to younger patients. We also saw that patients who were ventilated had a higher mortality than patients who were not ventilated. And put together, elderly patients who were ventilated had a very, very high hospital mortality. And this was also shown in uh, other publications from around the world showing high mortality for elderly patients who were mechanically ventilated. So age and ventilators, ventilation are one parameter, but we also need to look at the comorbidity uh, index and we can use different scores for multimorbidity, but we need to be careful not to discriminate against the disabled people who may have good physiological reserve but they are just disabled. Frailty is a condition which increases with age. It causes vulnerability to falls, increased hospitalization rate, and even mortality. And we use the clinical frailty scale, which goes from one, the very fit, to eight, the very severely frail. And it is customary to divide frailty into the fit with a score of one to three, the vulnerable with a score of four, and the frail with a score of five and above. And in the COVID study, which is a study of the uh, VIP network for European intensive care countries, we looked at patients over the age of 70 admitted to uh, the COVID-19 ICUs in 138 ICUs in 28 countries. And what we saw that increased frailty was significantly associated with 90 day mortality. So frailty, multiple morbidity and age together um, are used for triage. We can also try a time limited trial. This is a trial of full ICU support for two to four days or even longer in the elderly population and patients with COVID-19. And after this full ICU trial, we reassess the situation. If the patient is improving, we can continue. If the situation is unchanged, we may start a new time-limited trial. But if the patient is not responding and is worsening, we can either withhold, withdraw, or discharge the patient to a, a lower intensity unit. So how do we triage different patients? A 50-year-old male with COPD, bad COVID pneumonia, desaturating quickly on non-invasive ventilation, but he did not get vaccinated. Or a 40-year-old female with lymphoma, sepsis, who is immunized but immune suppressed. An 80-year-old male with uh, uh, heart failure, but uh, New York Heart Association one, so he's functioning, now requiring mechanical ventilation or a 60-year-old female with kidney transplant, immunosuppressed, 
but has respiratory failure. So really challenging triage decisions. And I would like to share with you a case of a 40 year old female with a past medical history of uh, insulin dependence, diabetes mellitus, who had a renal and pancreatic transplantation a few years ago, who was immunized but immune suppressed. And she came in with bad COVID pneumonia requiring mechanical ventilation three months ago. And now three months later, she's still mechanically ventilated via tracheostomy and look at her lungs. She has severe barotrauma, bulla, and uh, is critically ill, but has single organ failure. So does she deserve a lung transplant? Maybe, we are still waiting for the answer from the transplantation center, but uh, complex ethical decisions. And here is a, a video of our uh, ICU team taking the patient out to see the sun for the first time in three months, together with the ventilator, the monitor and the chest brain and really um, high complex uh, patients staying in ICU for a very long time. So the decision process we should ask ourselves is, does the patient need ICU? What is the severity of illness and the short-term prognosis, Apache, SOFA? What are the prior wishes of the patient, the comorbidities, the frailty? We can offer a time-limited trial after which we have shared decision-making for further treatment, escalation or de-escalation. The families were ex extremely distressed. Obviously, initially we did not allow anybody in. Then we only allowed the families to say goodbye to terminally ill patients. But then we understood that families really needed to go into the COVID ICU units. So we had a, a joint initiation with the social workers and the nursing staff to uh, uh, actively call the families every morning and every afternoon, every single family, to have communication via the iPhone or the tablet. And subsequently, we coordinated daily visits. And here we can see how we rostered the families to come in at a certain time during the day to visit the critically ill patients in the unit. We also had volunteers who were recovering for, recovered from COVID, who could enter the units and support the families, the patients and the staff. Um, we had the highest rate of vaccination of the medical teams in the country. 98% of the medical teams of Hadassah were vaccinated. And this was uh, on top of, again, making sure that we have enough protective gear uh, all over the uh, pandemic. We had staff support with psychologists and uh, individual and the support groups for the staff, mainly the nursing staff, but also the doctors. We have a post-COVID clinic where people with long COVID can come and see a multidisciplinary team to discuss their symptoms and potential treatments. So our strengths in the COVID was that, were that we had dedicated and willing medical and nursing teams to go in and work in the corona ICUs. And initially people were afraid to catch the virus and transfer it to their families. Uh, critically ill patients were treated by trained physicians and nurses. The medical teams were working together. The nursing teams were working together and we had a, a lot of training programs to support the teams. But we also had problems we did not have enough critical care nurses and beds, so we had to close some of the regular ICUs. We uh, had a lot of staff going into isolation, especially in the last wave. Uh, people were going and leave because they were positive for COVID. We have overloaded medical and nursing staff after two years of parallel activity and burnout. And we have collateral damage to patients without COVID-19 who needed ICU, but uh, obviously there were less available beds. So these are some of the patients who we ventilated in the COVID-19 unit who uh, uh, were discharged and came to visit us and say, thank you. Some were dancing and some were even gave birth after COVID. I would like to finalize for a few minutes to talk about the ethics in Israel because this influences 
our decision making in end of life and ventilation. And I would like to stress a few points relative to the Jewish religion, but maybe similar in the Catholic religion. Uh, it is customary in the medical society to, to say that there is no ethical distinction between withdrawing and withholding life-sustaining treatments. But in Israel, there are legal, social, and religious issues which influence our decision-making uh, in this issue. And what the law says in Israel is that you have to differentiate between continuous life support, which means that there is no um, uh, cycles. There are no cycles with an end and a beginning. Uh, the treatment is continuous, such as ventilation. And intermittent treatments, which have a cycle of a beginning and an end, such as dialysis or antibiotics. And the law says that it is forbidden to terminate continuous life support, such as ventilation, if this would lead to the death of the patient. So essentially, we cannot terminally extubate patients who will die as a result of this. However, we can terminate and not restart discrete treatments. So this is really withholding and not withdrawing. So we can stop dialysis and not restart it if the patient is not responding. The law encourages and respects advanced directives made by uh, dying patients. I will uh, define dying patients, but these decisions need to be, or directives need to be made when the patient is competent. And these advanced directives are usually unavailable. So the law of the dying patient defines dying as a patient who has six months to live. And the law uh, assumes, first of all, the priority of the sanctity of life. So life is sacred and must be maintained if possible. Also that most, most people do not want to die and we need to respect that, but they also don't want their lives prolonged artificially and definitely should not suffer at the end of life. They are as presumed competent unless proven otherwise Therefore, we have to ask them what they want. But, and, and if we ask them what they want when they're competent, we need to respect their wishes. But if they are not competent, it's more complicated because if they do not have advanced directives and the family cannot decide, then we have to give them either full support or at least fluids, nutrition, and analgesia. Active euthanasia and assisted suicide are prohibited and palliation is allowed and encouraged in terminal cases. So I will give you quickly two examples of patients uh, that we encounter in the ICU and what we do with them in Israel. Uh, the first is a 65 year old patient with emphysema. So end stage COPD on, on home oxygen. He arrives at the emergency department with shortness of breath, desaturating with pneumonia. He's given antibiotics, steroids, beta agonists, and non-invasive ventilation. He initially improved, but subsequently deteriorates, and he is intubated. Once he is intubated and mechanically ventilated, we assess the situation. And after seven days, it was quite clear that the weaning is impossible because he has emphysema. So he will undergo tracheostomy and will be chronically ventilated in a facility uh, uh, indefinitely as long, as long as he needs this. And this is obviously with no prior advanced directives. On the other hand, a patient with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis who is gradually deteriorating at home and requires nocturnal non-invasive ventilation can be asked whether they want to be invasively ventilated when the time comes. And if the patient is competent and he refuses ventilation while competent, his wishes will be respected. So this means that there are many ventilated patients who we cannot win and we cannot disconnect. So what do we do with them? So some of them are ventilated in the wards, as I showed you before. Mostly the elderly patients are not ventilated in the ICUs. And where are they discharged to? So we have many chronic ventilation centers in Israel. We have about 700 chronically ventilated patients ventilated indefinitely, some for even 10 years. We also have a home ventilation program where some of these patients can be ventilated at home. 
One of the biggest centers for chronic ventilation in Jerusalem is the Herzog facility. It is, it is a geriatric hospital with several chronic ventilation units. Uh, and look at all the people, the multidisciplinary teams required to treat these chronically ventilated patients. And here in the pictures, we can see that some of the chronically ventilated patients are mobile and they come to the central area during the day to be with their ventilated friends and watch TV. Some are not mobile and they stay bedridden, ventilated indefinitely. And in the COVID-19, the geriatric hospital in Herzog took uh, positive COVID-19 geriatric patients in to treat them instead of transferring them to the acute care hospital. There is also a chronic ventilation center for children. Uh, we have a good home ventilation program. This is a patient with ALS who was ventilated for many years at home uh, and communicated via a computer with his family by blinking his eyes. Look at all the multidisciplinary teams the home hospitalization program involves to treat the patient in their homes, physicians, nurses, social workers, occupational therapists, dietitians, et cetera. Obviously the advantage for the patient is that they're at home uh, uh, and with their families, but there is a lot of uh, physical burden for the family caretakers, but there is a lower psychological burden because the patient is with them. Obviously if the patient is in the hospital, he gets intensive follow-up and treatment, which is not available at home. But when we ask co cognitive elderly patients who were ventilated at home, uh, if they want to live and would they do it again, many said yes. So the take home message from my talk is that Israel has good health measures, but lower than average infrastructure. We have compulsory health care and insurance. We have good community and hospital care. Critical care is important, but needs constant maintenance and education. Outreach training programs for doctors and nurses are essential, and this is important investment for the future with future pandemics, disaster, and especially the growing elderly population. We have advanced support systems in hospital, including wards, intermediate care units, and ICUs. And we also have advanced support in the community, chronic institutions, and in the home. So what should we invest in? the human resource, the teaching, the training, teamwork, and we also need more beds. So this is the new round building that is being now built with your help, the 360 degrees of healing. And my unit will be here at the top with the 16, uh, a new 16 bed unit on the 10th floor. I would like to thank you very much for listening and uh, I will take some questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Professor Zviri. Um, I'm going to let people put a few questions in the chat or raise their hands. I can, you know, allow them to talk. Uh, in the meantime, I do have a question. Um, you talked a lot about, you know, your experience with COVID-19. Uh, I know that you also went to Argentina not long ago to help uh, uh, in critical care for COVID-19 there. Um, so you have a lot, a lot of experience. How are you gonna take all this experience for God forbid, the next pandemic, maybe in the future, how are you gonna take it for, you know, just now in the present, how you deal with critical care? Well, as I said, the most important thing is to invest in the people. Uh, it's no good that you have beds and ventilators that you don't know what to do with. You need to invest in the people. You need to train as many people as you can, nurses, doctors, in treating critically ill patients. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic is so important for the whole world, not only healthcare workers, for the whole world to understand the importance of critical care. Because where would we be if we didn't have critical care during this pandemic? So many more people, many people died, but so many more people would have died. 
So in order to invest in the present and the future, you must train all the time, all the time. It's continuous work, training more and more people to understand the physiology and the capabilities to treat critically ill patients. Of course, you need more beds and equipment, but the most important thing is to invest in the people. And this is why you invested your time now to help also other countries <laughs> with yes. the Hadassah experience. And I really want to thank you uh, from Hadassah International, but also from all the participants. Uh, and also some of them couldn't join and I will share the video with them. Okay. Um, for this incredible presentation, not only you talked about Hadassah, but also what's available in Israel. And it was really uh, very full and detailed to understand how it works. And if uh, you allow me, if I get questions, you know, via, via email yes. uh, after this presentation, I will, uh, um, you know, send them to you and we'll try to answer for everyone. Thank you again. Uh, do you have a, a, a few last words yes. uh, for everyone? Yes. Okay. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me <clears throat> uh, to Argentina in May. It was a fantastic uh, trip, really. Um, we felt uh, uh, we received a very heartwarming um, uh, uh, reception from everybody. And it was important to share with you our experience. Also, thank you for inviting me to talk today. I understand that many it's the middle of the day for you, so many people could not join. And I would be very happy to answer questions via email through you uh, or whatever other way. Uh, if, uh, if people have questions for me, I would be uh, happy to answer. And I hope you enjoyed my talk and I wish you all the best and that the COVID-19 pandemic will quickly go away and, the, and that we could all get our lives back as soon as possible. Thank you. So before we leave, because we still have a few minutes, I see yeah. that there is a question that came in and it's in Spanish. So you're not going to uh, uh, understand it, but I will translate it for you. Um, how do you organize the training and the, the academic uh, um, activities in the daily work of your service, of the, the, your unit? So how do you organize the training? And in addition, you know, how everyone is always working with the patients? So this is a very important question because we were very busy with COVID. Even without COVID, we are busy. So especially with COVID, we are very, very busy. And uh, this takes a lot of energy. So I would allocate uh, uh, an attending um, at a certain time. And I, we would take the residents for a clinical teaching round. Uh, we do teaching rounds every day on our patients. There, there is no just simple round. When an attending does a round, you teach throughout the round. And then in addition to that, we brought the patient, the, sorry, we brought the uh, residents on the weekends for training. So the echo and the um, ultrasound uh, during the COVID, obviously, were held in the weekends on Friday morning, Saturday morning, they would come and they would train. Uh, the others would allocate, the heads of the departments would allocate an, a residence on a certain day and time for the different workshops that we did, the airway, the ventilation, the echo, et cetera. So really a lot of, a lot of uh, support uh, by the department heads and uh, uh, management because we knew this is very important, but it's extra work. It's definitely extra work, but it's extra work. It's extra work and it sounds like you guys don't sleep much. <laughs> the future, we invest in the future. All right, well, thank you so much. We invest in the future. Thank you so, so much. Um, I will transfer any questions that I get. And again, like, thank you for your work at the hospital and for your uh, training tonight, uh, really. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Muchas gracias a todos. Espero verlos en la, el próximo evento de la Red de Salud. Thank you. Goodbye.